If you're a senior layouter, you probably know PCBs very well. But if you're not, chances are high that Maxwell will use one of his equations to mess up with your board and make your life miserable. You see, it's easy to think about PCBs as stacks of copper, insulation, solder mask and silk screen, but in reality, PCBs are far more than that. Because they are custom, they can be designed to manage heat, signals, EMI, mechanical stress and reliability, helping to make your design more compact and cheaper. In this video, let's uncover what really makes PCBs unique as the backbone of electronics. Before PCBs, circuits were built with wires soldered directly between components or using a terminal strip for mechanical stability. Although many ideas like PCBs have been patented since the early 1900s, it wasn't until 1936 when Austrian engineer Paul Eisler created a printed circuit board for a radio that PCBs truly took off. Since then, its development continued with the demand created by military and consumer applications until we got to the PCBs we use today. So, what makes up a PCB? At the core, they are often made of FR4, which stands for Flame Retardant 4. This material is an insulator composed of woven fiberglass coated with an epoxy resin that prevents fire from spreading quickly and gives the board mechanical stability. On the core surfaces, copper foils are laminated. By etching away unwanted areas through chemical or mechanical processes, the copper can be shaped as traces and pads following the layout design. On multi-layer boards, further insulation and copper layers are introduced to get to the specified stack up. Then, layers are connected to each other through holes on the insulation material, forming a via. There are many different types of vias, such as through hole vias going all the way across the board, blind vias which start from an outer layer and end inside without going all the way through, barrier vias connecting only internal layers and not visible from the outside, and micro vias which are smaller than other vias and only connect to neighbor layers. To protect the copper against oxidation and short circuits, boards are then coated with a solder mask, which can be usually green, but also red, blue, black or even white, which defines also where the solder is allowed to stick. The exposed pads are treated then with a chemical bath, such as HASL, ENIG or OSP, which can also help with the soldering process. On top, the silk screen layer is applied, giving you reference designators, logos and text, so you can actually read what's in the board. While most other components can be bought off the shelf, boards are unique in many different ways. Modern designs can have multiple types of layers. Signal layers are used to route most of the nets in a design and will have a larger amount of copper removed from it. Power planes contain power rails and are there to ensure low resistance and easy access to supply through vias. Ground planes are solid planes to provide the short return path for current through vias, minimizing the loop inductance. Common boards may have between 2 to 12 layers, but boards with 124 layers have already been produced. Most copper layers are specified at 1 ounce, but for higher currents, you can get layers with 2, 3 or more ounces, which help reduce the DC resistance of your traces. But when it comes to copper, more is not always better. This is because PCBs, due to their geometry, display a series of electromagnetic effects, resulting in parasitic resistances, inductances and capacitances that you didn't really want to have. These parasitics dictate how signals will propagate through the traces and can be critical for high-frequency interfaces such as PCIe and DDR. Large impedance mismatches create reflections that will mess up your high-speed signal. You can avoid it by using geometry to control the impedance value of the traces and using proper terminations to compensate for the differences. But if that sounds too complex, that's okay, because if your project is late, you will always have someone else to blame. Besides current, copper is also great in transferring another thing. Heat. When correctly done, copper pores and thermal vias can prevent hot spots, avoiding the need for external heat sinks. In this case, make sure you're using thermal reliefs designed to keep the heat in as you solder components. To design a PCB, start with schematics on one of the existing CAD tools for PCB design. KiCad is a great choice for being free and open source. Then, transfer your design to the PCB file, revealing the footprints of your components and their connections. Define your layer stack up and the other design constraints, such as via size and trace width. Make sure you check out the manufacturing rules from your PCB factory. These are usually available on their websites. Create your layout by arranging components and routing them through the defined layers. Create your copper pores and planes as you need them. Make sure you add thermal reliefs to the connection with copper pores to improve solderability. Then, generate the garbled drill files, which contain the drawings of each layers as well as the holes that should be drilled. And, if the manufacturer is assembling the board, don't forget to also generate the pick and place file with coordinates and orientation of every component. That's all for today. Now that you know the basics about PCBs, check out this cool video I made about diodes. And if you like this content, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for the future videos. Thank you for watching and see you next time on Microprocessed.